Well, Annie, thanks so much for taking some time to hang with me today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So um, specifically, I want to talk to you about your book today, which is called Keep Your Ass in the Saddle. Okay. We just got the E on the side of the podcast now. It is now explicit. Um, We don't do a lot of cussing (laughs) on this podcast, so I just feel like, whoa, we just... Went off the rails. Just took it over the top right there. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Um, (laughs) So uh, I think starting with the book is a great way to just kind of talk about your life because obviously the book is about your life, which is just you have an incredible story. So first of all, this term, keep your ass in the saddle. You know, I grew up in Kentucky till I was 16, but I was not around. People are like, oh, you must have been around horses or tobacco all the time. I'm like, no, I lived in a town and it was just houses like yours. So what does keep your ass in the saddle mean? I'm, I'm not necessarily familiar with that term. Well, for me, I, I, I learn a lot by thinking about life and metaphors. And so it's really a metaphor for myself to stay present and to be here now. I call it be where your feet are. And it's also another kind of metaphor for living in alignment with my own authenticity. And when I, when I stay in the saddle and I'm not reflecting on my past and I'm not projecting into the future. I, I really find where that's where pure possibility is always available to me. And when I wander off from that, then the fear starts to sneak in and the, you know, the probability thinking starts to think in and the, the thoughts around pure possibility seem to fade away. So it's a, it's a metaphor for that. And for those in our audience who've ever ridden a horse, if one is not squarely in their seat when they're riding a horse, the ride can be uncomfortable. So that's another reason I call the book that is just, you know, stay put. And also for those horse riders out there, a horse knows if you don't have a good seat. And if you don't, they, they'll they mess with you. And I think that's the same with the universe. The universe knows if you're being present or not and what, what, what your vibration is. And it, it will um, buck you off if you don't stay pretty solid in your seat. So that, that's the reason for the title of the book and the metaphors around it. That is good. I would say, the, um, as a side note, the craziest ride I've ever had on a horse was in Nicaragua. My family and I took a two-week vacation in Nicaragua, like you do, you know. It's a destination. And uh, (laughs) so one of the things that we found was like, oh, you ride a horse up to a waterfall kind of thing. And it was, the horse was literally walking over giant rocks. Like it was just a big pile of rocks. I was like, I can't believe horses are rock walking over big rocks. And it was, you know, probably felt like a 45 degree incline. I'm sure it wasn't, but oh my goodness. My ass was definitely not in the saddle. That was the craziest ride ever. Um, Okay, this is not about me. This is about you, Annie. Uh, (laughs) Back to your book. One of the very first things that I noticed, and by the way, the subtitle for those who haven't read it yet, and we'll have the link to Amazon in the show notes. It's Keep Your Ass in the Saddle, How a Farm, a Fire, and a Failure Led Me to Freedom. Now, one of the first things that I noticed in reading your book is that you called your father George from the very beginning. And I kept thinking like, okay, maybe she's going to switch to dad, maybe father or some point. It's like, no, she never did. Like it was just George the whole time. Why did you call him by his name as opposed to, you know, dad or daddy or father or something like that? Yeah. Growing up until probably I was 15 or so, I did call him dad. And, um, you know, he, we're all on our own journey, right? And as far as parenting goes, he probably was not going to win any awards and that's okay. It's just, he, he had his things he was dealing with. And so it was, we had a strained relationship at best. And um, so his given name is George and that's just how I started to identify him in my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, even to this day, I don't call him my dad. When I speak about him, I, use his given name. Hmm. Hmm. So that points to, um, kind of a rough relationship, not only with him, but a rough, rough childhood. I mean, I would, I would contextualize it as a rough childhood. Maybe you don't, I, I mean, it's, 
just you telling the story, maybe give people just a taste of where you grew up because, you know, this is not just a fun metaphor of horses. Like you have lived what it's like to work on a farm and not like uh, what I would call um, tourist working on the farm. Like, Hey, come out and pick some vegetables. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no, yeah. like here in orange County, California, we like pay $20 to go pick vegetables. You know, it's like, it's, I don't know why we do that, but that well, was not your I'll life. Tell you, no. And, and one, we wouldn't have made any money as a tourist destination because it is hard work. And a, a lot of folks don't want to go work hard on their quote vacations. They want to ride horses over big rocks like you did. Right. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I have to say though, I don't I don't view it even looking back at it. And certainly when I was in it, I didn't view it like that because it's all I knew. I didn't have a reference for if there was a different way to raise. And having having the opportunity to be raised on the farm, I learned so much. We learned a work ethic. Our dad, George, was a great cattleman. He taught us a lot about that. He taught us a lot about how to groom the land and grow crops and take care of things we needed to to survive because our survival was on the one wheat crop that we were able to hopefully cut each year and then my mom was a nurse so we spent a lot of time with George um, my mom worked every day and from a very young age six and up my two brothers and I, we were driving either a pickup truck, truck, a tractor, a combine, a semi truck, something. And we were doing long days in the seat of those pieces of equipment that are required to farm. So I, I really, I really feel so fortunate to have been raised there and have a taste for that lifestyle and really understanding the cycle of life and understanding that, that food doesn't come from grocery stores it ends up there. It actually comes from a lot of people working really hard to get it there. And so it taught me a lot of respect for nature and it taught me a lot of respect for the human condition and, and weather and seasons and just the fact that for me, in order to get something out of life, you have to be willing to commit to the work that it's going to take. Mm. Why why did you not continue farming? Like at what point in your life was it like, okay, um, this is not the life for me. I'm not going to inherit this farm or inherit this business. What made you move on? Well, I was young. I was only 17 when I left. And I think the primary reason was, is that at around the age of 15, George and I got in a dispute, if you will. And I asked him if I could, if he would pay me to work on the farm because we weren't getting paid. We were basically just, you know, free help for him, which is, is a good thing in many ways for him, especially. But I really thought in my mind, I spent hours sitting on that tractor and thinking about there's got to be something out there beyond the constraints of what I know on this farm. And we, we had a large farm. It was about 5,000 acres, but there has to be something bigger in the world. And I wanted to go find out what it was. I wanted to have some access to that and some experience of it. And the only way I knew to have that was to go get a good education and dip my toe in the pool of this great big planet out there and see what was there and if it was a fit for me or not. And I will also say that I, you can take the, the girl away from the farm, but it's hard to take the farm out of the girl. I have a sizable property for Southern California, at least. I have a John Deere tractor sitting in my barn. I nice. have a John Deere gator right. sitting in my barn. I have a brush hog sitting in my barn and weed whackers and all those kinds of things. It's a much more scaled down version of farming, but I still have it in my blood. <laughs> I don't even know what some of those things are. So I'm just going to take your word for it. They're yeah. like big pieces of metal. <laughs> yes, they <laughs> that are. Do, that do big things. So where That's did right. you end up um, going, you know, to your education route? Like t take us through that. And I can't even imagine if you're coming off a 5,000 acre farm into any kind of educational institution that had to have been kind of a golly moment. Like go, like when I moved from Kentucky to California, I was like, golly, look at this. You know, it's just a whole yeah. new world. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for asking that question. I was an athlete in high school and I wanted to continue to play sports in college. And so I was able to get a athletic scholarship for basketball and volleyball. 
in a private university in Kansas, which isn't too far off the farm. It was in sure, Wichita, sure. Kansas, sure. called Fringe University. And I did play um, volleyball and basketball for a couple of years there. As far as the transition from the farm, yeah, it was it was challenging because there was a lot more people around and there was a lot of things I'd never been exposed to that I was attempting to kind of put in some kind of order for myself. So it, it made some sense and it was, you Give know. Give us an example a, a of that. Anything that comes to your mind, like something that was like, whoa, uh, we did not have this back home. Well, for example, my roommate, my first year in college, she she came she came from a very wealthy family, and she spoke of the trips that they took to Africa and Europe and those kinds of things. And she wore the finest of clothes, and that was all very foreign to me. I I just had no idea, other than what I'd read, what that experience was like. So I it became evident quickly to me that I had. I had a lot of beautiful opportunity to learn what existed in the world. And I had had very little exposure to this big, bad world out there. Um, so that's one example of that. But I, I, I did find some grounding in the athletic part of it because I knew how to play basketball. I knew how to play volleyball and I was pretty good at that. And so that gave me that camaraderie of being part of a team. And then my second year uh, in college, I had a knee injury that required knee surgery. And that was a big pivot point in my life because up until that point, for the most part, I identified as an athlete. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the surgeon mm -hmm. said, you will no longer be an athlete. You cannot go on to play any, any rigorous sports like this because you, your joints won't handle that. So I had to stop this thing that I had so greatly identified with. And I, I felt lost. I didn't know what, what am I gonna do now? I didn't really know who I was and how I fit into the world. And so I decided the best thing for me to do was get a job, which would I could dedicate some time and energy to. So I got a job in a jewelry store and did that for a while and finished my studies and uh, graduated um, in four years from there. And then from there, went to work in banking. And that kind of started my, um, I guess, business career, if you will. Mm -hmm. Personality-wise, growing up, um, I'm curious about this because you... I mean, how you, we, and we've had several conversations, you have a bright smile, you're very professional, but I also get this sense that like, you could probably take me down in a fight. Like, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> like, I, I think I've been in one fight as a kid ever. So I'm like, oh yeah, she would kick my butt. So like when you were growing up, did people perceive you as, oh, she's a badass, like stay out of Annie's way. Or were you more kind of uh, kind and soft and empathetic? Like when I heard you started working in a jewelry store, I was like, it was like a record scratch. Like, er, like what? She, <laughs> what is she doing in a jewelry store? Tell me about your personality yeah. back then. Cause we all morph and change over time, but there is a sense of, you know, the golden thread. Were you kind of sure. harsh, kind of a badass back in the day? No, that's, that's, that's an excellent question because I, I think I, I do give off a vibration of being, a, I can be intimidating to folks. Um, and I think that's a, it's, a, it's just a confidence that I have and a certainty I have around life. But it, I, I think I can understand where that can be. Not off-putting, I think that's a little strong, but intimidating to folks. But when I was young, I was, I was incredibly shy. Oh, I did not want wow. to be around people. I, with my parents had company over, I would stay in my room. Mm -hmm. I was very um, uh, protected into myself. However, I think as I was going through being raised on the farm and being raised by uh, I well-intended parents, my parents were very supportive of all of us in our sports and they showed up to all of our events and they were doing the best they could with the resources they had. However, being raised by especially a father figure, a father, a male figure in my life, he was pretty rough. He was rough around the edges. I think at a young age, I started putting up these layers of protection for myself because in my mind, because we don't have a lot of resources at that age to really understand fully what's going on because we don't have references for it. I thought, okay, if he's not going to take care of me, I have to figure out how to take care of myself. And so I think slowly I rolled into this, what one could call 
are classified as a badass. And badass isn't a bad thing, but it's, it's, it's I think a, a, I identify myself now as someone who, I have a pretty big bubble and I, I quietly observe people mm. before I interact with them too much because trust is big for me. Mm. And I, I learn a whole heck of a lot more when I'm not talking and I'm listening and observing than when I'm carrying on. So um, yeah, I can, I can understand your perception of what, of what you see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and of course you're extremely kind and welcoming and big smile, but uh, um, yeah, that's interesting. So um, talk to me about how you navigated your way to Harvard, because this is from Wichita to Harvard feels like worlds apart. Like, how did you get there? Well, from, from, Ray, Colorado, which is the small community I was raised in to Harvard is probably in most people's minds, impossible. And as a matter of fact, I'm the only person who's ever done that, that was raised there. Not that, not that I deserve any rewards for that, but it's just, it's just a mindset that you're, you're not encouraged to have. It's, and it's not because it's not worthy, a worthy pursuit, but people in that environment just don't understand it. They don't know what it is. As a matter of fact, when I graduated from Harvard Business School, my dad didn't even know where Harvard Business School was. Mm -hmm. So the way I got there was I went into banking first. And then from banking, I went to work for a fellow who just recently passed away. As a matter of fact, Jack DeBoer, he started the residence in company. And that company was later sold to Marriott Corporation. And so I worked for Marriott for a while and I traveled throughout the Northeast Corridor and I bought land and got the construction contracting ready for the hotels to be built. And I was driving around, there's a corridor around uh, the Boston area for those familiar with, it's called 128. And I was driving around that one day and I thought, you know what, anybody could do this. And I'd heard of Harvard when I was in undergrad because the president of our school had gone to Harvard. Mm. And I thought, well, Harvard's right here in Boston. I need to go check this out. So I did. I went and looked at the campus and I thought, you know, I, I did some more research and I thought getting an, an advanced degree in MBA would probably be useful because I did want to go into being an entrepreneur. So I explored five different schools that I thought were, I, and I said to myself, if I'm going to do this and spend the money and the time, I want to go to the best school in the world, in my mind, not in every publication's mind or every person's mind, but in my mind. So I researched Northwestern, uh, University of Chicago, Harvard, Stanford, and um, Wharton. And through all my research, I decided for me that Harvard was the best school in the world. So I drove to campus and I picked up an application and I took it home and I started filling it out. And that was back in the day when you did it all by hand. And they, I think there were 17 essay questions and some other things that you had wow. to complete in order to get your um, application done. And um, I spent three or four months filling it out and I took it, I write about this in the book so people can certainly read about it. I take it in and I handed it to the guy that was sitting at the admissions table and he was kind of a big guy with questionable mm -hmm. personal hygiene, drinking this big sugary soda. <laughs> he took my application. He kind of just tossed it behind him in a pile of what looked like thousands of other applications. And my heart, I just, <gasps> I took this big breath. I thought, oh my gosh, they're never even going to find my application, let alone somebody read it, let alone think I could possibly be part of this fine institution. And I don't know how they went through the decision process. I really don't. But I found out, I think it was four months later that I'd been accepted. And um, then that began another journey in my life that I was completely unprepared for. <laughs> you were looking for him to have like this music, this moment, this celebration. Here she is. Thank you for bringing yeah. your application. <laughs> I was I was putting forth a masterpiece in my mind. And this guy, yes, he didn't get a rat's behind about what was on my piece of paper, let alone the other thousands of people that were applying to. So, yeah, it was it was kind of shocking to the system there for a few minutes. <laughs> Now, when you were at Harvard, were you working simultaneously or were you focused on school full time? They actually don't allow you to work. Some okay. people kind of work it in on the side. The program is so rigorous that it would be challenging. 
for folks to work. It's um, it's a forced curve. So 10% of the class flunks out. They call it hitting the screen. And for especially for me, because I didn't have the background, a lot of the students that my classmates came from engineering backgrounds and schools like MIT and Stanford and New York University and big, well-known places like that. I didn't. They also came from legacy families. I didn't. You know, grandpa went there, dad went there, my cousin, my whoever. There's this big lineage of people who were very well connected in that. It's a, it's not a cult, but it's definitely a, a community. Sure. And I, sure. I was shocked. I had no idea any of that existed. I'm, I'm a late bloomer and I went to my first class to figure out where we we're going to sit for the next year. And all the kids were talking to one another. And I leaned over to my classmate and I said, did I miss an orientation or something? Because it seems like everybody knows one another. And she said, no, my dad went to Harvard with him. And my cousin went to Harvard a couple of years ago. And, the, and she started explaining to me this, how this whole connection thing worked at Harvard. And I literally put my hands or my head in my hands and went, oh, I am so screwed. I, I felt like that from day one. It was, I was not prepared in any way, shape or form for what I was about to enter into. Mm. Um, it, it, I, I feel like the theme of so much of your book is the opportunities that you've had to develop grit and resilience, right? I mean, so much grit. And I think that probably ties in with the badass, you know, kind of connotation is like somebody who can get knocked down and brush yourself off and pick yourself back up. And I see that's, it seems like a theme for you, you know, of getting knocked down and then maybe not knocked down, but having challenges put in front of you. Um, I assume you see that. I mean, we all have challenges, but boy, it sure does seem like you've welcomed them into your life in some, you know, <laughs> unique ways, you know, just some big challenges, but also it's because you've had big dreams. You know what I mean? If you don't have big dreams, you're not gonna have big challenges because you could have just stayed back in Ray, Colorado and you may would have had challenges, but they wouldn't have been the type of challenges that you've had because you've had big dreams. So um, as you think back on uh, the last, you know, well, you're only 30. So 30 years. Um, I, I'm trying to, you know, figure out a nice way to say this over the last few years. Um, what are the, what are the challenges or roadblocks that you feel like have developed the most grit, the most resilience in you? And like, how, like, is, did you feel like grit and resilience was just like a byproduct of surviving or was it something you intentionally cultivated Help me understand that a little bit. Well, I certainly made choices that presented tremendous opportunities for growth in my life. And that's how I look at it is I think too, that the, the saving grace for me is in all the choices I made to go into those grit and resilience building challenges, I had no idea what I was stepping into. Mm. And I think my lack of knowing was useful because I think oftentimes if we know what we're stepping into, we may be more hesitant to take it on and embrace it. And then I'm also, the way I'm built is once I commit to something, I'm going to get it done no matter what. And so when, when I found myself in those challenging choices that I'd made, it was just a, it was a do or die thing. It's like, I have to figure out some way through this. Mm. And um, so the great news about that is look at, look at all the growth I got to go through. Look at all the things I got to learn, even the hard way or the late way. And look at how it kind of unfolded into the next thing in my life and really set up for all the other challenges that I might face in my life and gives, gave me the opportunity to know that whatever comes up, whatever I choose I can, I can manage that. I can handle that. I can figure out a way around it. I can, I can garner the resources that are needed. I can have the conversations that'll help me. I can ask for help if I need it. So I look at all of those for me. I, I, and I think language is very important is it's my belief that I'm where I'm in, in my life right now. And that all of our listeners are in their life right now because of the choices they've made up until this point. Mm. And we can change our life 
at any point by just making a different choice. And the reason I say that is I think a lot of times it's easy for people to blame our parents because right. it'd be really easy for me to be a victim, David. I, I could be the victim of, of the 21st century. I could blame George. I could blame growing up in a small town. I could blame being born into not much wealth at all, very poor. I could, you know, I could do that if I wanted to, but I choose not to because I, I don't think that that's going to benefit me. And to um, really understand that we get to create our life versus reacting to one we don't want. Mm. And it goes a lot smoother that way. Yeah, there are going to be hiccups along the way. Absolutely. Life's about uncertainty, but I think we're born with a certain kind of these factory installed constraints or constructs. And those are, what are those? They're judgment of ourselves, their fear, their inadequacy, they're not enough. And the real game of life is how can you get past fear to freedom? And to me, freedom is to know there's going to be uncertainty and challenges in the world. And the only discomfort is going to be my perception of the meaning I give to those particular circumstances. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. of course. Um, I want to talk more about what you're doing now in terms of kind of how you're helping people. But back to the book, if you were to, um, and we haven't really talked about the format, but maybe you could just give people an insider's view of the format of each chapter. And there's quite a few, you know, 32 chapters, um, but they're you know, quick reading because it's interesting and it pulls you from chapter to chapter. You're interested in what happens next, but the way that you formatted it, I'd love for people to, to know that a little bit ahead of time before they purchase it. Yeah. I, I appreciate you asking that. I, I wrote the book. I didn't, I didn't want the book to be about me as much as that I, I wanted to write it for other people. And so the format that you're talking about is at the end of each chapter, there's a pause and reflect. And I really wanted to, through some of the things I'd gone through in my own life, offer the, offer the opportunity for the reader to put the book down for a second at the end of the chapter and reflect on their own life and think, okay, I didn't go through the same experience that Annie did, but I can understand that I've gone through experiences that might have elicited the same emotions or might have elicited the same challenges. I'm going to just take this time to pause and think through that and reflect on that and to use that as a useful tool for people to manage some of the own circumstances that they might have faced at some point in their own life. And I, I offer kind of some of the things that help me get over the hump. And it, it may not be the exact same thing that'll help the reader get over the hump, but it who knows what it'll bring up for them to give them some traction to to let go of things that are keeping them stuck and get on this road of freedom that I was talking about earlier. Who do you think should read this book? Who's the best, like the best I know as an author, come on, I would say this, everybody, everybody needs to read my book, but uh, who would you say is kind of the, the person that would get the most out of it? Would you say? I think anybody who is ready to create a life they love, anybody who's willing to, let go of the death grip they have on wanting to control people, places, and things. And also people who are willing to um, give up the fight for their own limitations. Mm. You know, we're, we're comfortable with the limitations we put on ourselves. So we stay stuck there. Mm -hmm. It's for the person who's willing to get a little uncomfortable to explore their next highest level of being. And it's, it's work, it's challenging. And so if people aren't up for the task, probably not for them. Mm -hmm. It probably won't hurt for them to read it, but it's, it's, really, it's really presented in a format and the way it's written for people who are, are willing to take a real close look at how they're living their lives. They're willing to tell the truth about their life and they're willing to hold their own feet to the fire and take responsibility for how things are showing up for them. Mm -hmm. So now if we kind of jump ahead to present day life, you and a partner own Evolve Physical Therapy and Advanced Wellness in San Diego. Um, so that takes up obviously a part of your life. Um, but you also help people through a program called Lines in the Sand, a 10-step invitation to be your authentic self. And so it is a, uh, a program that people go through um, actually at your property 
which is amazing. Um, tell us a bit about why did you create this? Like you obviously, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's a financial benefit to this, but it's not like that's, it doesn't feel like the, you know, the major impetus, like why did you want to start this program for people? Well, in 2007, my house burned to the ground and the 12 year relationship that I was in was going up in flames one of the companies I was a founder of was in a very complex and expensive lawsuit with a big global company, and my dad died. And that all happened at the exact same time. And up until that point, I didn't realize it until all those things happened and the, kind of my world came crashing around me. I wasn't living life authentically. And so once I got to the other side of making a bunch of decisions about what a new house was going to look like, and I, you know, there's heartbreak when relationships break up, regardless of the circumstances around those, and regardless of your relationship with a parent, when they're no longer in your life, you, there's a grieving process. And lawsuits certainly aren't for the lighthearted, especially when they're pretty complex. I remember moving into my rebuilt home, and I'd had a a challenge with the flooring vendor. So I didn't have any flooring in the house. So I made the decision I was not going to move anything into the house because it would all have to be taken back out of the house when the flooring situation got sorted out. So I went to Target, I bought an air mattress and some sheets and a blanket. And I decided the room in my house that I was going to set up camp in. And I blew my air mattress up. And at the time I had a dog pork chop and he jumped on the air mattress next to me. And I sat on the edge of that air mattress. And it was only about 10 inches off the floor. Yeah. And I put my elbows on my knees. You might have to beep this out, but I'm going to tell you exactly what I said. No, you're and good. I said to myself, with my head down, I said, Annie, you must get your shit together. Mm. Because I knew in that moment that not only did I want to, but I needed to redesign my life. Mm. And so I lived like that for a year. Mm. I didn't bring TVs in. I didn't bring furniture in. I didn't bring wow. artwork in. I didn't bring anything in except the bare necessity, necessities I knew that, you know, food and a few pieces of clothing and that kind of thing. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to be this clean canvas and allow myself to feel the rawness of mm. starting over. Wow. So I went on a lot of walks and I chose the counsel of a few people that I trusted and I picked people who would hold my feet to the fire and not, not let me get away with making excuses for living a sad sack life any longer. And through that process over that year, I came up with these 10 tenets for myself. And those are the lines in the sand that I committed to from that point forward. That's how I was going to live my life. I was telling a good friend about it one day and she said, Oh my gosh, you should share this with people. And I said, no, I basically created this to save myself. I didn't, I didn't do this so I could teach other people or share this. She says, no, you really ought to. And I said, well, I'll think about it. She called me and she said, would you share your financial line? One of them is to be uh, impeccably fiscally fit with her company. She started Stroller Strides here in San Diego, which is now Fit for Mom. There's some listeners that have probably been involved in that in some way, shape or form. They were having their annual retreat. And I said, okay. And I talked at her retreats before and I would go and it was an hour, hour and a half. And it was at a winery or a hotel or something. And so I said to her, I said, okay, where are you going to be? How much time do I have? I knew what I was talking about. And could I come a little early to listen to some of the other speakers? And she got back to me and she says, well, we want to come to Painted Sky Ranch, which is my house wow. and wow. my barn. And you have the whole day, six hours. And we want you to take these 30 people through line seven, which is the financial line. I said, okay. And I'd never done that before. And so the day went great. It was amazing to see the transformation in these people. And after that, she said, you have to do this, Annie. You have to share this with people. So I said, all right. So I gathered 10 of my gal pals together. She was one of them. And I asked if they would spend one day a month for a year with me in my barn. And so we met one day a month for six hours and I created the curriculum and wrote the content around each of these lines in the sand and shared it with them. 
and work some of the kinks out and whatnot. And after that year, more people wanted to take the course. And then those people say, oh my gosh, you should put this online so people all over the world can experience it. So, it, you know, I didn't intend to do anything, but one thing led to another. And I thought, you know, even if, even if what I have to teach and even with what I have to share can help just one person, then it's worth doing it. And so that's how it came about. And that's why I continue to do it to this day. And is it available for people online or only locally in San Diego? It's available online. It's available via, I'm doing a beta class right now through Zoom because COVID presented me with the opportunity to see if that will work or not. And it does. It works really well. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'm getting ready. I think by July 1st, most of the dust will have settled if we don't have any other dust ups around this whole COVID thing where I can have people live again and people comfortably will come and be with one another. And we don't have to worry about some of the fear and challenges around that. So it's available in all three formats. I will say though, that doing it online by oneself, this is robust. This, this content is, it's, um, it pushes your buttons. There's a lot of big questions to answer. There's a lot of um, opportunities to get uncomfortable and so I think the support of having others in the group is much more beneficial than trying to kind of navigate through it on your own. It's certainly possible to do it, but I, I think it's, I think the journey is a lot easier when you have some support people around you that are going through it at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read through the 10 lines just so people get a, a kind of a picture of what they'd experience. Um, be authentic, view every experience as a gift. Quiet yourself so that you can hear the whispers of destiny. Embrace and practice surrender. Astonish yourself every day. Do right, not be right. Be impeccably, fiscally fit. Live graciously. Take responsibility for you incorporated and make a dent. So some really big ideas there to help people kind of process through in their life. That's amazing. Um, and if people want to learn more about that, they can go to meetmeatthebarn.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Meet yes. me at the barn.com. How did you come up with that URL? That is very unique. Well, when I first started this, uh, or, you know, I have a barn and I have this really beautiful property that I love to share with people. And most of the time people were coming to ride horses with me. So I'd always say to them, meet me at the barn. That's where I'll be instead of the house. Cause my barn's down low and then there's a midsection and then my house sits up on a hill. So I would just say, meet me at the barn. So it just seemed a natural thing for a class. And that's what I said. I said to all the women too, I said, you just meet me at the barn. That's where we're going to do this. So that's how the name came up. That's great. Meet me at the barn.com. And then of course, we'll have the link in the show notes to the book, keep your ass in the saddle. Um, how a farm, a fire and a failure led me to freedom. So I really do encourage you guys to get the book. It is a, um, it's a fun, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say fun. It is just powerful to, you know, see how somebody navigates grit producing situations. And um, there are some laugh out loud moments throughout the, you know, the book as well. Um, so watch out for electric fences. That's for sure. That's all I'd tell you. Um, <laughs> so uh Annie, if, if somebody's listening today and they're going through an experience that's painful, that's challenging, where they're feeling like, oh man, they're up against, you know, big, you know, they're against all odds kind of situation. What would you say to them? Well, that's such a good question. And I, I, I think the first thing I would say to them is embrace your humanity, give yourself some grace and there's nothing wrong with you. You're worthy. You are a beautiful human being. And I think the second bit of advice I would give to them is just let go. Allow yourself to let go of everything you're holding on so dearly because you're afraid of what might be on the other side of it if you let it go. I think that we create our own prisons in our mind because if we're, you know, it's, we're either in a mode of predictive thinking or mindset or possibility mindset. And unfortunately, I don't think we're ever given a lot of tools about predictive mindset comes from reflecting on the past and dredging and dragging things from past and current situation. It also is the past that informs the future. So if we've had challenges in the past, 
we use that to predict what might happen in the future. And if those have been not positive experiences in our life, we can get stuck in this middle ground of almost you're frozen and you don't know how to get out of this place of being stuck in your own mind. Because, you know, as you do, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners do, I know a lot of people that have a lot of things. They have the right car, they have the right clothing, they live in the right house and they eat the right food and they might even have a chef and go on these fun vacations and all those kinds of things. But if we're not free internally, we're gonna take that person with us to that house, to that car, to that vacation. And so you're, you're trapped in your own prison. And the best way to get out of prison is know that number one, the door's open. So you're not locked in. <laughs> you might be locked in in your own mind, but the door is always open. All you have to decide is step to the other side of it. And to really, like I, this whole conversation started out, David, stay present. In the present moment, everything's okay. Mm. We, get, we get off kilter. We get out of balance when we veer off too much in the past or too far in the future because you know, a lot of us spend a lot of time concerned for a future that hasn't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. So if we stay present and we trust that, yes, uncertainty is going to show up in our lives, but having trust that it'll work itself out, that things will be okay. It's, it's kind of a, a breath of fresh air. You can kind of just go, okay, if I can just trust in that and be okay with whatever happens in my life, I get to choose the meaning to it. Mm. get to choose the meaning that I'm going to give to that event or that person, that place, that circumstances. And I don't know about you and your experiences, David, but for me, I've always noticed that people, situations and things and life shows up for me to reveal where I'm not free. And my whole game of life is about freedom. And so I look at those, those people, whether they say something or do something or a situation or whatnot, when it triggers something in me, if I have the awareness to go, okay, Annie, you're not free there. And no. I can dive into that no. where I lack freedom. Then that's where the real freedom exists. I can finally let go of that. So that was a really long answer to your very good question. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Annie, thank you uh, so much for just taking time, sharing part of your story. Thank you for writing this book. Um, of course, we'll encourage people to go to meetmeatthebarn.com and check out the book, Keep Your Ass in the Saddle on Amazon. And we'll put all the links to your social media as well in the show notes. So thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time today.